Thank you. <laughs> and we are very happy to be on this stage. As you know, Gary Oldman is sitting next to me, unrecognizable from the film that you just watched, of course. And to my right, the director, Joe Wright. I am going to ask, uh, oh yeah, you can applaud some more if you want to. So. <laughs> I'm going to ask a few questions of our honored guests, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit time for audience questions at the end. Um, watching the film tonight for the second time after the Telluride Film Festival, I was even more aware of the obvious challenges that playing Winston Churchill would have posed to you and how extraordinarily well you met every single one of them. When you were first offered this part, were there hesitations? And what finally made you say yes? What was it about the particular combination of talent or playing this character that appealed most to you? It was fear. <laughs> I think, really, more than anything, I sort of, did I say no? Or kind of like, it? you kind of he hesitated was... and like sort of shook a little bit. And sort of went, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 um, yeah. Um, and sort of like that, yeah. really. Yeah, it was. You know, many people have played him before and uh, very well. And you, you, you wonder what you can bring that is new rather than new for the sake of it, you know. And um, Anthony had written a very good script. Joe, whose work I admired, so I felt, you know, in that, re in that regard, I would be in very good hands. Um, and then um, I, what, I think what it was is I sort of said, maybe, but then I went immediately to a tape recorder and thought, let me try him out, you know. Let me. So even though I was hesitant, it was already sort of uh, uh, bubbling around. Um, but I, I watched some early newsreel footage of Churchill, and I, I think what I had realised was that, that a lot of the represent he has been represented in older age. So you see this sort of rather grumpy curmudgeon shuffling around in his monogram slippers and uh, either in the wilderness years or, or the so-called wilderness years and in, in infirmity. And what I, what was on the page and certainly what I was seeing on this footage was someone who was alive, dynamic. Um, energized, you know, marching ahead of everyone, skipping around, you know, and a twinkle in his eye, he looked like a baby. <laughs> he did look like a baby, he had a very cherubic sort of grin um, and a real, a real twinkle, a real something going for him. And that was a Churchill that was, that was not in my head. I think I may have been contaminated or influenced by um, Albert Finney or Robert Hardy. So that, that was it. That discovery was exciting. And, uh, and then Joe and I spoke and, and, and we, we, we met and um, connected. And I felt that if I was going to step out on the wire, that I would have a very, very good safety net. Yeah, I think that turned out to be the case. And um, I mean, for Joe Wright, I don't know how many of you have seen Atonement, but in that film you had, <laughs> among other things, such a memorable about five minute virtuoso tour de force tracking shot of the evacuation of Dunkirk. And that was quite a few years ago. I can't help but be aware that this year We've already had quite a few films that deal with Dunkirk. Um, 
there was uh, Their Finest earlier this year, which was a slightly more comic treatment of a group making a propaganda film in Britain so that uh, you know they would galvanize support for the war. There was a Churchill that starred Brian Cox released within this year. There was, of course, uh, Christopher Nolan's Dunkirk. Um, and uh, I don't know whether it's a coincidence, but what was it that made you decide to do it at this particular time? Um, well, I guess, you know, I, I, which answer? Um, the, the, you know, it would be nice to be able to order life into a neat little sequence of cause and effect, narrative events. Uh, it doesn't really work like that. Um, I haven't got a clear, clean answer to that question. Um, it just kind of happened, really. And, and then I look back on it and post-rationalize it and realize that this is what I needed to learn from that experience. And, um, and, and what I needed to learn from the experience was the importance of doubt and, uh, and how doubt can be a element, a force for good, and that without doubt there is no wisdom. Um, but all of those, you know, and I, I guess I had an idea, a clue about that stuff, but all of that stuff kind of reveals itself to you as you're making the film. It doesn't really, you don't go, oh, this is the film I have to do because X, Y, and Z. Um, uh, you know, um, it's like these things are revealed to you. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, yeah. yeah, no, and I can give you other versions, you know. No, 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 it like, makes sense. Um, okay, uh, next version. Um, <laughs> Uh, um, I had just made this um, big, you know, Hollywood studio movie, and um, and it had lost about a hundred million dollars, and um, not something you ever want to experience. Um, the responsibility was crushing, and um, and I felt like I just wanted to do uh, drama in really small rooms. Um, uh, <laughs> Another reason was that, you know, I, 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 I looked at the script and I was wondering about um, Churchill and who might play him. And I thought, mm, Brian Cox, no thanks. I um, uh, don't want to go and see it with so-and-so. I wouldn't go and see that. I wouldn't see, who would I see in this movie? Who would I pay money to go and see play Churchill? Um, Gary Oldman. And I thought, well, Gary's never going to do it, do you know what I mean? Because he's the greatest living actor there is. Um, and who am I to work with Gary Oldman? Um, I'm a little snot rag. Um, uh, so I'll do it if Gary Oldman does it, but that's not going to happen. Um, and then, you know, then you go, Gary's doing it. Um, and, uh, and then you go and meet Gary, and you discover him to be the most gracious and um, uh, generous actor. And you go, oh, OK, well, I guess this is what I'm doing then. There are many different reasons. Also, I needed the money. <laughs> OK. <laughs> that works. I want to go back to... You have to, to earn a living. <laughs> you have to earn a living. <laughs> You've got to earn a living. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds from what you just <laughs> said really that old. the voice of yeah. Winston Churchill was one of your points of departure. Because I'm often fascinated when great actors take on a part like this, whether they begin more with the voice or the physicality, whether it's more the body or the way that you're going to sound. And could you tell us a little bit about how you prepare, not just in this case, your accents among some of the films <laughs> that we saw the clips from tonight, the, the timbre of your voice changes so much depending upon the film. How do you do that? How do you approach this whole question of vocally becoming a character? Well, Churchill had a very distinctive um, cadence, more so when he spoke publicly. Um, there, were, there are inflections that, go, that, that he ends lines where he goes up, for emphasis, and he also goes down. But he takes the tune, it's like he tunes it down. I went to, I worked with, I decided um, his range is a little lower, a little fuller than, than my own. 
and uh, I worked with a with a man who is uh, he's a uh, he's a singing teacher, but he's also an opera singer, Michael E. Dean. And he came around. We had a few sessions. We went to the piano. We worked out the range of Churchill on the keyboard, and then with exercises and working with him, as well as working with the ta with the recordings, you find. We did. We just worked out what, where, where, what notes, what lower notes I needed to hit. Mm. Um, it, of course, the added thing is, is it, it, he it, Churchill would work until three or four in the morning, and uh, as he wrote to his wife in 1924, he said for dinner, um, um, I love champagne at every meal and plenty of uh, claret and soda in between. <laughs> so you would hear these recordings, and you would, could always tell maybe if he had had a few brandies, and he had had a bit of a late night, because you could hear it in the... So that was, a, that was challenging, too, to get that gravitas, that, that whiskey cigar sound. Um, but that was what, that's how I worked, that's how I sort of started uh, with him because there's several things. You're playing arguably the greatest Britain that ever lived, for, for, for starters. But you are playing an iconic character whose silhouette, he, the, the shape he, he makes in space is very is very iconic, um, and that sound is we we or, or we think we remember. You know, it's that. <laughs> and if you go and listen to him, really very, listen to him very carefully, he he does. He he, he doesn't really sound like that. You know, it's. Um, so that was that was uh, that, that's really how I start. I'm also, you know, I'm an Englishman, proud to be British, and um, I have been asked over the years to play um, Americans. So, you know, from the get-go, that's what you've you've got to do, and it's and it's you you do try and make it the work as specific. As you, as, you, as you can. And do you find it more challenging to play, quote, real people? In other words, if it's Lee Harvey, Oswald, mm. or, or Sid Vicious, I mean, do you feel a greater responsibility in terms of getting that sound in your head first, or is it all of a piece? Yeah, it starts with the sound, yes, I think. It, it's also, you, I feel that you have you have a responsibility to the family, to the people, you know, to the icon, to the image, or whatever, what, you know, whatever it is. Um, uh, with, um, with, uh, with Sid, <laughs> I, uh, I, I spoke with his mother and visited with her. Um, we met some of the Churchill, Churchill family, but, um, it, it, it depends. I, I, it, it's you with fictional characters. You start with a blank canvas, and with Churchill, a lot of the pieces are already. A lot of the picture is already filled in for you. Right. Now, I was a little surprised a moment ago when you said that you wanted to make a film that takes place in small rooms, um, because your opening to the movie we've just watched is one of the more breathtaking examples of a mobile fluid camera. I mean, yeah, we're in a room, all right? It's the you know, parliament, whatever, the House of Commons. But you start from this extreme high angle, and then the camera swoops down, and then, if I remember correctly, it tracks back, and then it tracks back in again, and I'm, I'm so aware of the space and of the fact that I'm gonna have to trust the filmmaker because he's obviously aware of the camera as the narrator. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you were conceiving 
of that level, not just the work with Gary Oldman to be the most extraordinarily convincing, persuasive, sympathetic Winston Churchill that I've seen, but the framing of Winston Churchill in terms of your visual storytelling? Well, um, because so much of the film takes place in very small rooms, uh, I knew that, and also one of the problems with the shooting, and often limitations liberate you, right? Um, you use the limitations. Uh, so for instance, when Bresson made A Man Escaped, he used you know, practically one room and one lens, the 50 millimeter, and then he could do anything with that. Um, one of the limitations imposed upon us in this film was the fact that uh, we were shooting, you know, it's set in May 1940, one of the hottest uh, on record, uh, and we were shooting in December and January. Uh, so uh, I couldn't really shoot outdoors. So that's part of the reason why I decided to make the whole film so interior. Um, and, and that adds to the claustrophobia, um, which then builds on the tension and so on. Um, so uh, a lot of the film's happening in small rooms and I needed some scale somewhere. And as I couldn't go outdoors, um, uh, I chose to make the parliament sequences, the three scenes, beginning, middle and end, basically give me the scale um, that I needed. Uh, so I fought very hard to build um, that set rather than shoot in some church hall where you couldn't really get high angles or whatever. We built that as a set. Um, and I had thought about the idea of these top shots being a kind of representation of the God's eye view. In this case, God is Winston Churchill. Um, uh, or the, the guy that manipulates... What's that movie? You'd know. There's a movie, it's like a 1950s movie about Greek gods and they're playing with mortals on a chessboard. Do you remember what I mean? It's really kitsch. It's a terrible movie. Yes, exactly. Right, Clash Thank of the Titans. You. Thank you very much indeed. And I always remember these gods playing with characters as if they were on a chessboard. Thank you very much, on a chessboard. Um, and I had that idea about Churchill and, and his, you know, um, uh, cabinet and, and generals, that they were playing with, with human lives um, in that way. And so, that so they, have, they have the kind of perspective, the top shot perspective, really, looking at maps, then the maps turn into those big kind of landscape shots. Um, so I decided to use that motif as the opening shot of the movie, um, because in a way, uh, I'm placing the audience immediately in Churchill's point of view of the situation. Um, and also, as an audience member, we're kind of gods overlooking this, um, this uh, chaos. Then, the important thing about that scene is it's about chaos, basically. The only thing you really need to know is, despite the long speech Attlee gives, is that Britain is in chaos. Uh, so we needed to create that atmosphere of chaos. And so we needed to explore the chaos before we get into the detail of the speech. Hence the pullback and the, and the pullback like that, right? The pullback bisects the frame, um, bifurcates the frame so that you have the, the Labour Party on the right and the Conservative Party on the right. And that frame explains the fact that there are two sides and that they're warring each other and they're throwing stuff at each other. And they're basically behaving like children. Uh, then the camera moves in to Attlee. Um, and we start to listen to the dialogue. And so the lot of the dialogue, you know, Hi um, Hitchcock had this lovely idea that the dialogue is what happens whilst the eyes tell the story. Um, the writer's not in the room, so I can say that. Um, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so once we start to move in, we start to take the ear to the dialogue, right? Um, uh, and I start in the mix, I start to bring the, the, the background down and I start to bring the uh, dialogue up. And I go into Atlee. Um, and we hear, we time it so that it basically arrives at him when he charges, um, charges Chamberlain. And then I got Attlee to point, and that, that action there motivates the left pan. Um, uh, that takes the camera across to, uh, to Chamberlain, and there is the problem. And the shot ends with the problem. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I hope you all understand that this is um, one of the examples of what a director does, even when there's a very strong screenplay, and even when there is an utterly gifted actor at the center of the film, there are so many questions about where to put the camera, when to move it or not to move it, what is the point of view? And that is beautifully illustrated. And I love the fact that I'm kind of waiting for Winston Churchill. I mean, I know the film's about Churchill, and he's not there. His hat is, you know, clearly denoting his absence. And when do I finally get to see Churchill? A spark. You know, you have him emerging from darkness mm. with the lighting of the cigar. And then I actually have to lean in to go, that's, that's Churchill, that's Gary Oldman. Now, so this leads me to the question, Makeup is absolutely crucial to your performance and to the way that the film yeah. can succeed. And I was curious about, first of all, did you rehearse in makeup? In other words, how much was the makeup a part of the character of the physicality from the get-go? Um, and I hope you don't mind, I'm gonna invoke something that Francois Truffaut once said that I found fascinating. He said, whenever an actor has something between him and the camera, whether it's scenery, makeup, the actor has to work harder to make his presence felt than if there were nothing between his face and the camera. I, I don't know if that's at all relevant here, but just how the makeup, to what extent the makeup was crucial in your ability to be this character? Um, well, the makeup was the elephant in the room because I look how I look. This lovely man over here cast me so we sort of had to sit together and say okay you know how's this going to work um, so that was always it, it was inevitable you know I didn't have the time um, to go away and I'd have to gain to get those jowls <laughs> I mean I would have to gain about 80 pounds and I was not going to do that I'm nearly 60 I thought I'm not going to you know, I'm not, I'm not going to do... De Niro did it once, definitively. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and uh, so it was going to be... It was going to be a make-up. I knew uh, Kazuhiro, who designed it, and I think we sat in my kitchen, and I said, in my opinion, there's only one man in the world that could even that could possibly pull this off. It's like that heist movie you were talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Like that. There's only one man for the job. There's, well, there's one. Kazuhiro. Yes. <laughs> and it, it was, and I remember Joe took out his, note, his little notebook and his pencil and he said, how did you spell that? <laughs> I think you remember and you, wrote, and you wrote the name down. And so we then embarked on this. Well, he's retired from the movie industry, so I had to do a bit of seducing to sort of having come back, you know, he's retired and he's, a fight, he's now a sculptor and doesn't, doesn't go near movies anymore. He, he didn't like actors. Because <laughs> they, they wouldn't sit still. Um, but uh, he was a wonderful makeup man under Rick Baker. That's where he started. I think it got to a point where Rick, the teacher, said, I cannot, I cannot teach you anymore. It, almost the students are passing the master. And then, uh, and then, anyway, he, he, he got out of film. So we got him back, and then this real process of, of uh, testing, uh, you know, there was a, a, what I call a full Winston um, that didn't quite work, that looked odd, that totally, I totally was lost. And so through a series of tests and adding, taking away, we found what we felt was enough spirit of Winston, but yet you could see Gary. And then he went and re-sculpted and finessed it. And that's sort of how it, it, came, it came about. I, he has a secret the reason I think why the makeup, I think the makeup is actually a benchmark. I think the makeup was, it's groundbreaking. And Kazoo has um, a, a formula, a secret recipe like Colonel Sanders, you know. 
um, that he does something to it. You know, it's his thing. And uh, so it is not cumbersome or heavy or in any way intrusive. You, you, it's like, oh, I, for, oh, I forgot I had it on. <laughs> you know, it's like a cross your heart bra. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, do they still have those? I wouldn't know. <laughs> I do remember the co- I, do, I remember the commercial. Yeah, I, I forgot the commercial. I was wearing it. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, you're not you're not aware that that and that's the weird thing because you're talking to someone and they're looking at you and you're Winston Churchill, but you're you f- kind of forget what you look like. But I must say there was no uh, I, did, I felt that I I needed no I didn't have to push. Um, it it was the most relaxed and the most free I've ever been in front of a camera. Uh, Maybe it's just something to do with the disguise. I think it's partly to do with with that. Um, But uh, we had four weeks rehearsal. That's what I was about to ask, yeah. Four weeks is a lot. Yeah, Joe loves rehearsal. Actors like rehearsal. I do anyway. And uh, so there were times when I would rehearse in the makeup. Um, But we got a chance to walk the scenes, breathe them, change dialogue, or if it wasn't working... You, it was such a joy to say the words out loud with the people that you were going to be making the movie with rather than arrive on a set like a lot of films are made and you know you've got to you it's like uh, it's like rock and roll you know it's like you've got to you've got to you've got to burn from the first bar mm-hmm. and uh and we talked about this in Telluride. Do you remember that, I do. that about the thing of some directors believe that you're like fireflies, I think? Who, who was it who said that on the panel? That, um, Greta Gerwig? Maybe? Yes, Greta said that it's some mysterious thing that you've got to capture. And yeah, sometimes you get lucky on the first take and you get magic. But... Um, I loved working with Joe because we got a first one in, a second one in, and we started to cook, you know, as Ben Mendelssohn would say. Let's, let's, let's throw another pancake on the grill. <laughs> the, the, the very first day we worked with Ben Mendelssohn, you know, we did the, one, we did the first take, and Joe said, mm, okay, that was a good, you know, and Ben went, it's a first pancake. Come on, you know, come on. It's just the first pancake. We can get it a little crispier. We <laughs> <laughs> but that was, a, that, that was a real joy, having, having uh, rehearsal. And I think, Joe, you like actors, don't you? Yeah, I love actors. Yeah, that, that kind of shows, not just in this film. I mean, I'm even remembering uh, a wonderful movie you did called Hannah with Sir Ronan and yep. Kate Blanchett. And even though it's more of an action adventure film, I remember the care with which character is developed and, and one really knows these people even if their actions are a little bit on the, the larger side. As long as you invoke Telluride, I, I do want this audience to hear something that you said there that was to me v- quite revelatory. You talked about how important it was the chair that that Winston Churchill had actually sat oh, Winston's in. Winston's chair. Winston's yes. chair because of the the, the behaviour. Yeah, I, I, I just I, I I would love for you to go back to yeah. that because it was one of the more interesting things. Yeah, we got um, we were very fortunate to have the sort of behind the velvet ropes tours of these places like Blenheim where Churchill was born and then of course Chartwell where he lived and Downing Street and the war rooms. So I was allowed into the actual war room and um, got to sit in the chair that Winston sat in during the war. And what you noticed was on the, on the left arm with these 
really deep, like divots in the chair and scratches from his fingernails and in the right hand arm were scratches from his ring. And that's a wonderful thing for an actor, you know, so you have that, you have the stress, you have the anxiety, all of that that now is, it lives in this piece of furniture. It's a wonderful thing for a director as well, because you can express, you know, in a, in a macro close-up, you can express the tension and the rhythm of the scene very, very quickly. And isn't it right after the call with FDR that you actually see the, the ring going back and forth into yeah, that he, chair? He, after, yeah, he has that moment when he puts down the phone and realizes that, you know, he's not That gonna... shot was actually taken from another scene. Um, the, the shot after the FDR phone call was taken from one of the war cabinet scenes um, and luckily it was so tight that you couldn't see the context of the room. Uh, there had been a scene that went after that FDR phone call where he got the idea to go and um, call up uh, Dover and, and request the armada of boats and I cut that scene and included that instead as the thought process that led to the decision. Uh, it certainly worked well there. The magic of cinema. <laughs> yeah, well, editing. And actually, that, that reminds me, I don't know whether this was in the script, but I found the second time so exciting the way that you cross-cut the delivery of the speech that Winston Churchill is, is giving with the process of composition mm. of how it was created, including the extreme close-ups of the typewriter um, going in or even... In a, if I remember correctly, a low-angle shot from under the yeah, typewriter yeah. of Lily James. Um, just talk a little about that. Was that in the script, or is, did you decide that you wanted to, you know, break this up in, in terms of visual excitement? Or it was in the script. Yeah, was. there was a version of a, of him, you know, writing the thing, uh, cross-cutting through time uh, as he delivered the speech. Um, kind of reminded me of the love scene from Don't Look Now. Um, oh, I know uh, exactly what you're talking about. Future. It's one um, of my favorite scenes in yeah. film history, even though it's not a movie I ever want to watch in its entirety because it still gives me nightmares. But Nicholas Rogue yeah. directed this with Julie Christie and the great Donald Sutherland, and it cross-cuts yeah. the Forward lovemaking with the memory of the lovemaking yeah. after the fact. So I, when I was at Yale University, I remember they were showing it one night. I had to time it. I didn't want to see the scary scenes because it is a horror film. So I timed it to walk in just for that scene. Yeah. Loved it and then left and went back to life. <laughs> it's a very but rude I, scene. But I remember you getting the shot up through the typewriter and, yeah. Yeah, and that was in rehearsal. We were rehearsing yeah. one day and you yeah. suddenly scrambled under the table, got on your hands and knees and went, Oh, yeah, that's a good I mean, shot. <laughs> rehearsals are really good for the actors, but they're also really, really useful for me to be able to think about how I'm going to shoot the thing, you know. Um, it's through rehearsals that you get to explore the geography of the scene and the pace and the rhythm of a scene, especially something like that kind of 10-minute cabinet scene where uh, you need to fully understand it so that you can express it cinematically. I don't like, I don't like coverage. Okay. The coverage. Good. I have uh, one or two more questions and then we'll take from the audience and I know that it's been a long evening and for these guys who've been promoting the film all week, they, they still have much to do. Um, I was curious about inspirations for you as an actor and for you as a director um, because there have been quite a few great, especially British actors who've managed mm. to kind of disappear into roles. That's one of the things I think you do better than most actors I've, I've ever come across. Who were some of the actors when you were coming of age that inspired you or helped to shape your sense of the profession? Albert Finney, Alec Guinness, Peter Sellers, yeah. Tom Courtney, Alan Bates, uh, uh, Love Vivian Lee. I'm sorry? Vivian Lee. Vivian Lee, of course. Um, uh, Solari, I suppose. Laurence Olivier. Um, American actors. I am a huge uh, fan of um, George C. Scott. Oh. 
um, <laughs> the more more recent, it was obviously De Niro was an influence. Just but the, the the coupling of De Niro and Scorsese, I think, was absolutely magic. Um, there are many, many. I love Gene Hackman. Yeah. I, I could watch the conversation. I, I was about to say, the co I show the conversation you know, in my classes yeah. every year. This is Coppola's film that we almost showed the night that he was my guest here on stage. And then he talked for so long that we, we threw it in it as, a, as a thing after the intermission and only about 10 people yeah. stayed. <laughs> and, but, don't, you know, but you have, you know, it's not just actors. We were talking earlier about Kislowski, who is an influence. I love Pasolini. Um, uh, Tony Richardson, yeah. you know, it's, uh, so you, you, you pick up, you, you know, you, yeah, it's, I mean, we watched, my wife and I watched uh, I Confess the other night. The Montgomery Hitchcock, Cliff? Yeah, because you, he, he gives a look in the movie, there's a look that he gives someone in the movie, and um, that the, the look he gives is worth the price of the admission. It's just you know. So you you have you have films and you have as a whole, but you also have very specific moments, moments in films and things that directors and the actors do, or writing. Right. Aaron Sorkin, you know, it, it, he's a genius. And I and, and again, we just went on one of those big binges, you know, where we watched the entire West Wing from soup to nuts. <laughs> Then we watched um, a Bartlett for president, and then we uh, and then we went on. Uh, then we did Studio 60, and then we did the newsroom. You know, and you just marvel at this <coughs> giant of a writer. Um, Tennessee, Eugene O'Neill. You know, it, the list. The list is just. Yeah, I, I appreciate many of the names you've invoked. Um, and for you, Joe, is there, are, are there a few that, especially when you started out, that you were thinking of? Um, my mum. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was about six uh, or seven, I went to see Close Encounters for the third, of the third kind. For the, and it was, it was my first experience of uh, the cinema. Wow. And it scared the uh, living crap out of me. And I spent most of the film uh, hiding behind the seat, kind of just like that. Um, uh, but, um, and I think my career ever since has been about overcoming that fear. Um, but I went home that day and I said to her, um, oh, uh, how do you make films? And, um, and <laughs> I want to make one. Um, and she, a uh, very clever woman, happened to have a long strip of cartridge paper, like a toilet roll, you know, but cartridge paper um, that you could draw on. And she divided a bo uh, the first uh, bit into a box. And uh, we drew, she got me to draw a picture of um, uh, St. George and uh, a princess. And then we divided it, uh, another, and the, the dragon came and stole the princess, and then we divided another box, and then St. George's on his with his lance, and then he arrives at the cave, and there he sticks the, I was very influenced by that wonderful uh, Renaissance painting with the um, Pirandello, and, uh, and uh, Uccello, um, and uh, the, he, the lance is in the, the dragon's eye, and so on. And then uh, we got two garden sticks, and we put the film onto the garden, the, the, the paper onto the garden sticks, and we got a shoe box, and we cut an aperture in the lid of the shoebox, and then we wound the film, uh, this strip of paper, uh, through the aperture, and she said, that's how you make a film. Whoa. Um, Your parents were theater people, right? Puppeteers? They were puppeteers. They were yeah. puppeteers, yeah. And, and, and they founded a theater in London, and yeah, so you were exposed to it pretty early. So that, so that, idea that film is about a sequence of images telling a story goes back to that experience. And then, as I, you know, um, got a little bit older, it was, it was a bit catastrophic moment when I discovered that you needed a camera, because um, I'm not at all scientific, and I thought that was really scientific. Um, 
Uh, but then I found out you had DPs, and that was all right. Um, uh, but I used to make kind of little sets. I remember watching David Lean's um, uh, Oliver Twist, and I thought it was amazing, and I wanted to do the Magwitch scene, so I went down the local fruit and veg market. This is when I was, like, about nine. I went down the fruit and veg market, and I bought some AstroTurf, um, or blagged some, and made a kind of um, graveyard set uh, where I was going to show... And I made a poster... Um, and I was going to shoot the, the, the graveyard scene, the famous graveyard scene uh, there. And, um, and then David Lean went through. Uh, when I was 15, my parents went on holiday uh, and left me alone in the house for the first time. And by that point, we had a TV, uh, which was like, you know, um, big deal. Because uh, we didn't when I was kids, because we were hippies. Um, uh, and, um, and I managed to get hold of two VHSs. One was um, uh, Taxi Driver, and the other was Blue Velvet. Um, 15 and, years old you were? Yeah. Um, and I literally, and I also discovered Pot um, <laughs> that same summer. And I basically sat watching those films like that. I thought. Blue Velvet was a comedy, um, <laughs> funniest film I'd ever seen. And, uh, and I watched those films on rotation for two weeks solidly. Um, and again, they're both storytelling with images, you know. Um, and that blew my world because it was like discovering, it's as if you've been brought up with Keats and Byron and then discovering there's Bukowski and Ginsberg. You know, there's another way of expressing the human experience that that as a kind of adolescent one began to feel, you know. And then about 18, I was looking for some form of spirituality and I discovered uh, Tarkovsky um, and that opened that whole kind of um, world to me. And I went on a long journey into European and Eastern European f filmmaking. Uh, Klimov's Come and See was a big influence. Um, uh, Krzyzlowski and, and, and all of those guys. And, and so I came to American filmmaking. No, well, yeah, not so much the kind of commercial filmmaking, really. I was very, I, 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 I considered myself to be very art house when I was younger. Art house? Yeah, I was like art house. <laughs> you know. There was a director, there's a great British director called Alan Clark. Yes. Uh, who Gary had um, uh, the, um, if I can say, fortune to, to work with. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and Alan Clark was like the great, you know, there was like Ken Loach, uh, Mike Lee, Alan Clark, and Alan Clark died young. Uh, but in my opinion, he was the greatest of the British realists. Stephen Frears was to say Frears. he yeah. was the best. Yeah, he, he was, was extraordinary. Yeah. He was extraordinary. He was a guy from the north of England, had gone off cutting logs in Canada or something, and he joined yeah. the Navy. He became a director quite late. He made The Firm that Gary was in, um, which is, if you haven't seen it, is one of my favorite performances of Gary's. He also made a film called Scum. He also made um, an you know, amazing thing called Road. Um, he, he, Rita Sue and Bob Too. Um, and, uh, but a lot of the TV work that he did was really important as well. Wow. Thank you. That was, I learned a whole lot more than I thought I was going to. Sorry. We're going to take questions in a moment, but I, I did want to ask one thing for Gary Oldman, because this is a director as well, and I don't think most people know that. Um, they're going home. A few. Well, th we, we, this going, is a little late, but we'll, we'll, uh, well, whoever wants to stay you. will stay. The bus is um, will stop right. <laughs> <laughs> Can no. we go home now? We'll I let really anybody leave home. who has to, I'm but hungry. we have at least two or three questions left that right. we want to take from the That's audience, right, too. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I can wait with my question, because obviously some of you might have. I saw one hand go up right away. I can ask my question about what you've directed in just a moment. Yeah, we sure, have one sure, right sure, here, sure. the gentleman here. Yeah. The question is, recently this gentleman read if, if Winston Churchill had not done what he had done when he did it, the map of the world would today be considerably different? As we now know. As we now know it. Do you, 
Do you feel that this movie has a relevance today beyond the historical relevance of the story? Given the instability that we now know. Given the instability right. that we now know. Well, the world, well, the, obviously, the world, would have, the world would have looked very different. The world would have looked, thank you. The, the world would have looked very different because we would have, if we had capitulated and begun with, the, with, the, with the, the deal, I don't know whether it would have been a, a short process or a long one, but um, there would be Nazis walking on the street in England. The swastika would be flying, as he said. German would be introduced into the schools. Possibly, I think, likely would have become the first language. We wouldn't have been in the Mediterranean, the English wouldn't have been in Africa. Germany would have probably got to Russia earlier. Then there wouldn't have been the winter that held them up, that ultimately really defeated them. So they would have gone into Russia earlier. Um, they already had the V1 and the V2 rocket. So their science was, and they had the jet plane, so their science was way, way ahead. I mean, it, it, it's, it's interesting to note that the, th that the British army was 300,000 men that almost perished in Dunkirk, and Hitler had five million. So he would have had a huge armada. He would have had an incredible army they probably would have, German scientists would have come up with the H-bomb, and if they hadn't taken Russia on, you know, in, a in a more traditional way of warfare, they would have probably nuked, nuked them. Um, and then they would have, I guess he would have then turned that armada towards America. Mm. And he was, it, it, so that was, it, you know, I think it would have, it, it, it could have, you know, it could have looked like that. Do we, we, I say we, I can't, but it, you, I mean, you never set out to make a topical, a, a relevant film. I mean, the germ of the, in fact, the germ of the idea uh, from Anthony McCartan, the writer, um, I think it was what five or six years ago that he that he mm. had the idea to to make a, a to write a screenplay about this very specific moment in time these two couple of months that, that took place in 1940. So it's not a it, it certainly wasn't in the consciousness because things in the world had not those seismic shifts that that continually happen. Had not, had not happened, and we certainly didn't have the presidential campaign, there was no Brexit there, when, we, when we started. We didn't, we didn't, I don't, you didn't know, even know that Chris Nolan was doing Dunkirk. Mm. Mm. So it was, it's like... We tried, I tried adding some lines, you know, um, to, uh, there was a point, you know, there was a point where I tried to, add some lines to the script that made it more kind of, you know the scene where he's in the plane, he looks out the window, he sees all the refugees, right? And I added a line there where he said, this can't go on, something as bad as this can't go on, we must form a European Union. <laughs> um, uh, it wasn't quite that bad. But as soon as one did that, you could feel the the director, you could feel a point being made, you could feel it becoming didactic. And I think that, to me, is disrespectful to an audience. Uh, the point, the purpose of the storyteller is to pose questions and to present scenarios and then offer that to an audience and say, tell me what you think. And hopefully, um, the stories that we tell uh, will inspire debate and conversation, um, and, and hopefully people will do the right thing, you know. But, but, but one, it, one doesn't, 
it's, it's, I think it's very dangerous to set out uh, to, to make a kind of didactic movie, you know. The interesting thing I, th I find about Churchill is the way that he's claimed by both sides of the party spectrum, the political spectrum. Um, we, were, we did a, we did a Q&A with um, two of your uh, congressmen the other day, one Republican and one Democrat, uh, which was fascinating, fascinating how pally they were backstage. Um, uh, that was really weird. Um, uh, but what was interesting is that in the Q&A, they both claimed Churchill. Um, uh, and I find that kind of um, useful. I think Churchill's useful in that respect. You know, if you make a film about Clement Attlee and the foundation of the social, you know, the welfare state or whatever, you're going to get sort of, you know, a few um, uh, of my family's friends going to see it, but you're not really going to inspire debate. Yep. Answer. Okay, there is right. one gentleman here and then one here, and I think that's going to be it. Yes? Yes. Is there, if you could, I'm sorry, I repeat for everybody, if you could play any character connected to World War II, that historical era besides Churchill, who would it be? And the other part is, uh, do you have any sort of, um, anyone in your personal history or family or friends or a role or someone you would like to tell a story of uh, about your, you know, your personal history? And is there any other character, somebody close to you, the story of whom you yeah, would um, want to tell? Well, I, uh, I, I sort of did that a little with the, uh, with Neil by mouth. Yeah, I was about uh, to ask. The <laughs> uh, sort of taking um, characters from from growing up in South London. Um, so I, f I feel that I've serviced that need or desire. Um, I don't have a bucket list. Most of the roles that I have played have were incoming. I've never chased anything. And... Um, Would you ever do Hitler? <laughs> I have been asked to play Hitler. Oh, really? <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't fancy it. No, I, there's a role. I was asked to play... I've been offered Manson. Charles Manson. And I was not interested. I did, who, want, who wants to, who wants to play Charles Man? You know, don't want to go there. Don't want to go there. You know, it gets in you. It's like I can't make a film about a serial killer because I can't think about serial killing people for two years. I'll go, you know, <laughs> you know. I want to make films about love and then and you know or 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 you know inspiration and then live in that for two years. And this is a film about love because not only is there obviously the relationship between a very loving and supportive relationship with, with Winston and Clem Clementine, you know, in that, but it's a love letter to the British people. The resilience of the, and God bless them, the working class, you sort of <laughs> said. Um, you, you, you even include the, the shot from the slow motion from the point of view of Churchill in a moving vehicle and then Something I doubt Churchill ever did, actually meeting with the ordinary people, you know. Didn't no. do that, no. Yeah, but it's a wonderful moment in the film where you <laughs> feel that Winston Churchill does care somehow about the individuals whose decision, his decisions are going to affect their yeah. lives. I mean, it, the, the scene, obviously, on the underground is really, is, is, a, it is a sort of foreshadowing of that relationship that did develop between him and the public and he was often seen you know visiting uh, areas of London after they had been bombed and out and about with the people you know but um, yeah no 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 bucket list okay. we'll have to see Gentleman what comes right there, in quickly. across the desk Churchill siblings, all of them. For example, Harry Potter, all these are children 
Okay, one second. Uh, whoa, one whoa, whoa. question, one that question. That was a mouthful. Um, I, yeah. One just question. a second. I mean, if I'm understanding, I'll, I'll, the background will hold off for a second, but the question is about the roles that you have played and to what extent there is not only a continuum but ac accumulation, whether it is the godfather of Harry Potter, the acknowledgement of evil in the world, yeah. Commissioner Gordon, which is, uh, I, I'm sorry, I missed a little of what you said. They refer to him as a wartime yeah. hero, but now in peacetime. And has that fed into the character of Winston Churchill as you played it? I think that was the question. In retrospect, do these roles subconsciously come together in what I you think, do? I think very simply what, what happened I'm really short answer. is, huh? I think it's what did you say? <laughs> make it a really short answer. No, I'm going to make it a really short answer. Yes, in, an, uh, in uh, I got pigeonholed for a while to play villains, and they paid very well, <laughs> but... Um, it was always this thing of, oh, if someone, you know, get Scary Gary, you know, cast, <laughs> you know, a villain. And I just got so tired of it that I just had to say, no more villains, no more. And let me play some good people. And certainly Potter and uh, Sirius even though we think he's a villain to begin with, but we realize that he's the godfather. And then, of course, Jim Gordon, who is the best man. He is the incorruptible man. Um, so perhaps, perhaps, you know, there's a, there's a link. It was, it was really a decision to, to turn the ship around and say, please, no more bad guys, because I'm a teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe on that note, just one thing. November 22nd, Darkest Hour opens at Lincoln Plaza, Regal Union Square. Tell people if they should see it. Thank you, Joe Wright and Gary Oldman. Yeah.